We are produced by Dylan Bishop. And in studio, Mike Height, Sarge, as in delegate, as uh, holding over from the first segment, along with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Bill's nervous this morning. I can I can sense the nervous energy here. I'm a, my audio plug keeps being unplugged. Well, quit getting out of your seat to go to the bathroom every yeah, five minutes. <laughs> also in studio, uh, attorneys, Michael Carl, senior member of this uh, organization here. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. What do you think of those Bill Powell blueberry uh, muffins? There, oh, they're great. Aren't they something? Yeah. yeah. Also, attorney Larry Schultz. Great to be here. Good to be here. Good morning to you. Larry, you see the smile on his face. He's also, ready today. He's ready. <laughs> Attorney Joe Ferretti via telephone. Joseph, good morning to you. Good morning. I just want to let Larry and Mike Carl know that Mike Height referred to us as the Three Stooges. <laughs> so I, I've already threatened. One of them was named Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I've had that rehearsed a few times since grade school. Actually, one of them in the, you know, the one of the backup Stooges was named Joe. So there you go. That was also true. You had even. Lower on the totem pole than Shep was Joe. Nobody liked Joe or Shep. When you had a Shep, uh, Three Stooges, you were like, yeah. Carl, it makes you moo. I guess it does. <laughs> Mo, welcome in. Mo. <laughs> Mo money, Mo money, Mo money. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Intros. And, and let me just say, for the intros today, uh, my intro will be setting up the Admiral's intro. All right. He's the anchor leg here today. So we begin with what a week it was, beginning with that stock market twitch that was caused by a downgrade from some dude named Fitch. Seems it didn't matter to him whether the economy was strong. Old Fitch was ticked because we all couldn't just get along. When that market index drops, it may not affect your health, but it sure as hell has adverse effects on Michael Carl's wealth. <laughs> Amen, buddy. <laughs> This guy's not that old, but he's got a few years on him. And he's uh, lived longer than that Led Zeppelin drummer, John Bonham. He moves at his own pace now, and that's just the facts. And he's never been one to jump for political party hacks. But I've never seen this guy move like I saw two weeks ago when Larry Schultz called out Ronald Reagan right here on the radio. <laughs> he leapt with a ferocity and quickness. I didn't think he was able. Now known as the day, Mike Height went all cheetah and jumped across the table. <laughs> Amen. In his own words, he said for this, he'd call in from his deathbed. That was right after all those Trump indictments were read. No way he was going to miss this Friday show, because if there's one thing he wants, it's Trump to go. So if you're looking for a person to talk about how Donald Trump got indicted, you just found one in Larry Schultz. And oh, yeah. He'd be just delighted. <laughs> I sure am. He wonders aloud, where have all the good leaders gone? Once again, we got to make a decision between Joe or Don. 330 million people. And this is what we're going to get again? If we rank them on a scale together, they wouldn't equal a 10. But I've got a suggestion when it comes to the next White House resident. We nominate Joe Joey Torts Ready and have our first Italian president. <laughs> Were, were you born in the United States, Joe? <laughs> Kenya. He was born in Kenya. The Italian Kenya. Kenya, Italy. <laughs> the original Star Wars movie starred the imposing Darth Vader, and then the Empire struck back in 1980, three years later. That sets the scene for this past year of Friday Five introductions and all of my incarnations and weekly reproductions. And just like in 1980 when the Empire struck back, at some point, one of you would rise and begin to counterattack. And that day is today, as our Obi-Wan Kenobi raises sword and shield. Ladies and gentlemen, with his own intro, our resident Jedi, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah. You know, listening to you, Rob, makes me wonder why I even tried this. <laughs> you did such a marvelous job with the introduction. But Ken Apple was on a couple of so weeks ago, and Ken gave an introduction. I, yes. I, I, I'm muted. He's got me muted. Or is it no, me? you're not muted. You just kicked your headphones out again. No, I, Are you, do you need to go pee again before we do this? <laughs> Keep pulling your mic cord. <laughs> okay. No. Anyway, Ken did such Take a Take his coffee away from him, Mike. Will you do that? <laughs> Take over, Joe Ferretti. I need help. Okay. But anyway, uh, uh, Ken did such a great job, and I thought it would be kind of fun to try. And uh, I called on a couple of colleagues because I'm not a poet. I don't rhyme well. Uh, 
it's, uh, it's a lot of reasons not to tackle this one. But with Joe Ferretti and Bonnie's help, I put something together. I did not run it through the other Friday Five, no. knowing fully well Mike Height would say, bad idea, Captain, <laughs> bad idea. And Larry Schultz would have said, Stay in your own lane, bro. Stay in your own lane. And Mike Carl would have said, if it's not about Hunter Biden, I don't care. <laughs> that may be true. <laughs> <That's> true. <Yeah. laughs> so, so here it is. I am a professional, so don't try this at home. This Trumpian-like statement didn't resonate alone. There is a stern among the polywogs of the briny deep, and the lawyers and politicians are rising from their sleep. The master skills are legendary, and some say downright scary, but that didn't stop others from trying, using reframes ranging from truth to lying. The funnest man on radio was witty and had a chance, but failing to rhyme pepperoni didn't enhance. Our best-selling author, who turns nice guys into respectable villains, whose demise are not helped by penicillin, but his propensity for signing off with, damn it, gave elected officials reason to condemn it. Uh, the Friday Five carries its own burden. Certain Tesla with an R are grounds for certain rebuke. Even if one tries to regroup, why shouldn't every issue be about Biden or Trump? A sure way to get an audience bump. Why should turning off our cell phones be a necessity? After all, these are our identity. But aspirational wannabes, there are some areas we may wish to compete. However, the Rob Rant is in itself unique. It has been too long since we received this full-throated blast. Following this introduction, perhaps once again we'll be left aghast. So, thank you, Woo Admiral. <laughs> it doesn't compare to the uh, to the Rob introduction, though. No, I, even with uh, Ferretti's help, <laughs> we had to shorten those a little bit. You, you did. Yeah. When, when you first brought that out, it was a scroll that was like yeah, the, it did. <laughs> and. If the ones of us, ones of you that remember Rivers Run Through It, where the uh, the father went to the son and said, cut it in half. Well, I, Rob said that this morning, cut it in half. I gave it back to him, cut it in half, cut it in half. So what you're seeing is the bare remnants of what was there. That's what we need, more bare remnants around here. Hey, thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. I give you credit for taking that uh, that task on. Well, I found that what you can do in a few minutes took me a lot longer. So this was the one and only. They'll not to be a. They'll not be a repeat. <laughs> well, I, I want everyone to know that Bill offered to not do that this morning. I begged. <laughs> <laughs> offered is a nice way of saying begged. And I said, Bill, you can't because my whole intro is based on your intro. I'm, I'm, I'm basically introing you to intro me, so I can't rewrite yours at this time. Hey, our leadoff hitter is Joe Joy Torch, ready via telephone. Joe, you are up and on the clock. Bill, the only thing you were missing was that fake mix of New Jersey and Pittsburgh accent when you're delivering. <laughs> <That's> right, <exactly>. <laughs> <Fake>. <laughs> the Pittsburgh accent ain't fake. <laughs> I earned that one. Uh, All right, so uh, look, I, I know we're going to launch into uh, the indictment and, and coming on the heels of Bill Powell's excellent uh, appearance to discuss the legalities. Uh, I'll save some of that for Larry Schultz, who I know is itching to go to uh, that subject. But, I, you know, what got me thinking, fellas, was um, – and this, this is not a, a good example of this, but when, when uh, uh, Delegate Hardy announced that he was not going to seek reelection to go down and represent us in the legislature, uh, it just had me sit back and say, boy, sometimes we just lose good people in terms of uh, our elected representatives – uh, and, and what's going on nationally with our presidential election and, and who the purported nominees are going to be from the Republican and Democratic side uh, has me thinking, why can't we get better people to run? So that's my question this morning. Uh, why are we in this predicament of potentially having to choose between Trump and Biden once again? When I, I would submit a, a wide swath of the American electorate doesn't like those choices. Is it, can we blame the media for how they approach these elections and how they like to continue to cover Trump because he brings ratings? Uh, and people like Jeb Bush, who, you know, granted is, is not the most uh, appealing uh, individual, doesn't have a persona at all. 
uh, you know, he, he, they fade into the background. Uh, is the process way too long? Donald Trump announced in December of last year, almost two years before the election that he was running. Now, he may have done that for strategic reasons, but is it too long of a process? Or is it us? Is it the voters? Do we not ask more of ourselves uh, in terms of ha- what we think a, a good president should be? Do we, do we vest too much authority in the president? And, and do we contradict ourselves in terms of public policy, a- arguing for less taxes, yet we like the money to be spent in our jurisdiction? And, and finally, uh, <laughs> is it the case that you have to be crazy to run for this office to begin with because – the scrutiny and, and everything involved, the, the begging for money, uh, it, it's just too much for most people to handle, and uh, we don't, so we don't get good candidates. What's at the root of this, and, and really, how do we try to fix it? And, and maybe I could add one more possibility to this, and that is that maybe we are what we see running for office, and we just don't like to admit that that's who we are. Anyway, let's start with Larry Schultz. Larry? Yeah. Sure. I, I mean – um, I think there's there's a lot of reasons why people otherwise qualified might say, you know, I don't want to be president of the United States. By the time you're of an age to have done that, you've had a career doing something else. Maybe you were a senator or a governor, but maybe you were um, some sort of tech innovator or some other kind of a non-political business person who decides, okay, I'm going to run. Most of those people do not win because this high-level American politics is a very uh, complicated skill that you don't just learn by hanging around and listening to the radio. Sorry. I mean, you, you, you have to develop this ability to be at the one side, on the one side, a caring individual, on the other side, somebody who can take almost any kind of insult without losing his cool. And there aren't a lot of people who are up for that, even at the highest levels of the Senate and the House and the governorships. Uh, They would love to be president, don't get me wrong, they don't want to run because it is a painful thing to do uh, to face all that scrutiny and all those questions. So I think one of the reasons we don't find more candidates uh, on both sides is uh, it's just a extremely difficult job and if you want it there's a 50 50 chance you're going to come out despised by the end of (laughs) eight years or four years and that's not a good feeling having invested that part of your life i think that's the thing billy yeah i agree with joe's point i certainly agree with larry's point as well i think there's another one another point as well and that is the are the way our political system is set up we all say, and I think most of us are correct in saying we're moderates. We want a, a good, solid, truthful, honest, hardworking person representing us. Uh, kind of like a Jimmy Stewart of Mr. Smith goes to Washington many, many years ago. But the reality is that to be elected in a primary system, the most important thing is your extreme political position. Moderates cannot get elected as a in the primary system anymore with with very few exceptions. You have to be the extreme. So you come back to the point that Larry was making, you're you're walking into the office represented or supported by only the extreme position as you go through the various uh, election processes and it's difficult to stake that middle ground after you have been at running campaigning as to to appease the extremes of the party. Mr. Carl. Well, let me <clears throat> start with a slight disagreement with the premise. There are a lot of really good people uh, actively seeking the Republican nomination. But I totally agree that the, the choice of Trump versus Biden is a bad one. And I certainly Trump... Uh, his style, you know, t- directly, you know, from the beginning, taking on the media, stimulated the media to respond, and and they love they, they love it in the sense that it creates controversy and you know has draws a lot of attention, which is what they're in the business of drawing attention, and and um, uh, Biden is 
there be, be and I will assert that I absolutely agree with the premise that there aren't many known, obviously qualified Democrats, you know, uh, making the effort. Uh, and and they're no doubt put off by this system, and and the I think the media is the key uh, culprit to to why we are stuck with Trump and Biden. Biden simply because he's he's represents the party, and he was the the only you know viable, at least in the view of some, uh, candidate for president in 2020 on their side, and and the and the mass of the media is favor favors that party. So that's why we have those two, and and to I I'd say the biggest culprit in the whole uh, bad choice situation is the media. Mr. Heights. Well, let me first address the first part that, that Joe brought up in, in John Hardy. Um, and as much as uh, John Hardy's departure from the legislature hurts the legislature, um, I do believe he will be elected uh, county commissioner. And as much as it hurts the legislature, it helps the county commission. He will be a great asset to, to Berkeley County. Um, so I applaud that. As far as the, the presidency and the reason we can't get quality candidates, I, the, the amount of arrogance it takes to run for president, I think, is one of the big detractors. I don't think you get quality people that are that arrogant a lot of times. Um, and they have to have the tenacity to go uh, after their, their opponents. Um, and the ones who don't have that tenacity are the ones like Jeb Bush that sort of fall off to the side. You, you have to be, you, you have to be tenacious in, in your, your desire to be president. And you also have to set up a, a great strategic team around you to find the pathway to get there because it takes lots and lots and lots of money. Um, so you have to be a viable candidate from the get go. Um, I haven't seen, well, you know, I, I'm going, I'm going to catch some hell for this, but I, I think Obama was a quality candidate, except that I didn't agree with most of what he had to say. I, I don't think he was, he was, he was arrogant like you needed to be, to be president, but I don't think he was, uh, a, an evil person or a bad person. Um, and I, I can say the same thing about the Bushes. I don't think they were bad people. Now, I, I can't say that about Trump. Trump, Trump is so arrogant um, and, and criminally stupid um, that, that he affects himself. Uh, I, I think Biden is just criminal, period. And... <laughs> And stupid on top of it. Um, and, and if you listen to some of the things that Obama said, he thinks the same thing. Uh, Clinton, while I thought he did an okay job compared to the last couple of, of uh, leaders we've had, um, I don't think he had a whole lot of scruples to him at all. And certainly his wife didn't. So um, it's tough to find good presidents, good presidential candidates, but I believe we've had some in the past. It's just difficult to find them. Yeah, talking about somebody in the past that we don't recognize the time, Harry Truman is a perfect example of it. Harry Truman was not liked at all. In fact, there's an old joke was that he was, while in office, flying an aircraft, throwing out a, a dollar bill. And someone said, what are you doing, Mr. President? He said, I'm throwing out a dollar bill to make somebody happy. They said, well, jump out yourself. You'll make everybody happy. <laughs> so so, uh, so that's the, I think that's the way we, we view people in real time. Now, history sometimes changes our view. It certainly has with Harry Truman, and who's to say what it might with others. Joe, back to you. Well, uh, first of all, uh, Mike Hyde very well said about uh, uh, John Hardy. Uh, and I, I, but I, I was struck by Mike Hyde saying that he's going to catch hell for actually saying something nice about Barack Obama. And, and, and I think that, in a nutshell, Rob, proves your point to some degree, that who we have to choose from in this upcoming presidential election, it looks like, uh, is a reflection of us. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of, of what sells today in politics. 
Chuck Schumer, uh, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, made some very inartful comments about the Supreme Court justices to the point where they had to have uh, elevated security around their homes. Uh, not good. But he knows politically that's what moves people today. And now we have uh, our, our fellow uh, governor from Florida now, DeSantis, on the stump yesterday saying that on day one, he is going to, quote, slit the throats of the members of the deep state. Now, and he knows that that is what moves people today. And as an electorate, I think we have to take a step back and examine ourselves, because I think who we have to, to choose amongst uh, for this highest office in the land, the most important position perhaps in the world, uh, I think we have to understand that this reflects on us, and we have to understand also that what's important for that position is not somebody who appeals to violence or, uh, as Mike I said, has this tenacity, uh, 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 just a dogmatic approach just to uh, solving our problems. We really need somebody who's going to be a leader for all of us, not just 50 percent of us. And I hope someday we get there. But I, I, I fear that what we're going to face in the next year is not going to be to our liking in terms of who we have to choose from and what it says about us as a country. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that our politics is similar to the media hype around professional wrestling. And it ought to be similar to something a little more dignified than that. But it, is, it isn't. I mean, look at the, at the two leaders, right? You have uh, the one guy who's very raucous and outgoing and constantly attacking people, and the other guy who's almost completely silent and you can go back in the history of pro wrestling and find a big match that was held, and that's exactly how people looked at the two guys. But we've uh, proven that the kinder, <clears throat> gentler approach doesn't win. You just can't win with that type of approach. I can look back through history and think of several people I would have liked to have run for, for president, a Colin Powell, a Condoleezza Rice, those types of people. They, didn't, they would not have won. They're just too nice. They... Uh, very qualified sure but they just would not have won but we have had nice folks win in the past jimmy carter is one that comes yeah, to mind we're, but we're not there anymore we're well, just, i think we're, I, we're I too agree. divided i agree with you mike i think we just set unrealistic expectations for the person in the office as to what kind of a human being they should be you know the, the, the it's the presidency it's not a kingdom and it's not a dictatorship so that means that anybody born in this country can grow up and become president so that means that person is human they've got a lot of faults they've got a lot of problems and by the time they get to that point in their life they've got a lot of baggage they probably haven't worked out <laughs> and in this era where everything you do is under immediate scrutiny from so many different sources to be a person in charge hey I don't know why anybody would want the job <laughs> and B, I'm not sure why anybody would even think they should do the job but how can you possibly expect a person to meet the expectations that we put on our leaders in this country? You can't. It's, 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 it's a system where the person in charge is doomed to be met with the sentence that I set up Joe's introduction with. We can't do any better than this well, <laughs> because and, and, it's one of us. And, and that <laughs> this is be, as good as we can do. That's why some of these good people don't run. You know, it's, it's just not worth it to them to go through that type of – to put their families through that kind of scrutiny. And that will wrap up segment number one. So let's welcome back our co-hosts for this second hour of the program, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, who came armed with his own introductions today <laughs> as well. Good morning, Billy. Good morning, Rob. The Sarge Delegate Michael Height. Good morning, sir. He is the senior member of this crew, the longest reigning dictator of the Friday Five, <laughs> Michael Collins. Be feels good. Thank you. Bill does feel good. He likes that power position. Attorney at law, Larry Schultz. Great to be here. And attorney at law, Joseph Joey Toitz-Ferretti. Good morning. 
That was that was quick. Very, yeah. very, <laughs> nice. very brief. Very, very nice. And, and, uh, yeah. uh, Eric Oroke on uh, Facebook uh, page, Joe, said you're uh, very, very likable. Did you see that? I, I did not see that. Well, I'm, I'm going to get that framed. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wrote a very nice paragraph about you there. Uh, oh, so I, that, that's I like him too. Yeah, do you <laughs> think that is it nice, Larry? I like you this morning. <laughs> Well, I like you too, Rob. I liked you before this morning. Well, thank you. <laughs> Mike, I love you, even if your Cardinals always finish ahead of my Pirates. <laughs> yeah, we're falling quickly now. Thank you. Height, I'm warming up to you. I might All like right, you right. by next week. <laughs> Let's hope by the time the show's over. The show. <laughs> That's enough, Rob. That's enough. <laughs> now, as we all hold hands, form a circle. Bill leads us off in issue number two. Number two. Uh, Rob, this past week, Fitch uh, uh, downgraded the U.S. Uh, uh, credit rating, and we saw the impact of it. This market went down. Uh, but that was over something fairly minor that they view that the Congress is not talking well among themselves enough to uh, among, to, to steer a, an adequate course for our financial future. That brings to mind what are we going to be seeing in the near future. Uh, by the first of the year, ideally, we will have 13 appropriation bills signed by the president. It's always a, a heavy lift, but that's what we uh, what should be done, what had been done in the past. Congress is, if not on uh, recess, they will be shortly, uh, not coming back until early September. That leaves only about two or three weeks to sign these bills. Not a single one has been presented and discussed or signed at this point in time. So it's 13 of them, a heavy lift. Among this, there's a group of what they call the Group of 20, which is to the right of the Freedom Caucus that's, makes it, that's making it very clean, uh, very clear. They're going to use these bills basically in hostage to drive the point across. They're not happy with the government. Uh, there, uh, one of them recently said, if we shut the government down entirely for an indefinite period of time, that would be what he would prefer to do. So there's going to be a, mood, um, um, a move among this uh, group of 20. There's a second reason as well. They, w they wish to embarrass the Speaker of the House, McCarthy. So these two things going together, I think we're going to be very, 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 unlikely of seeing any of these appro uh, uh, spending bills approved. And it's going to, in effect, shut down, if not all of government, shut down large portions of government. I would like to add an addendum that should government be shut down, I also would like to see every elected member of the House uh, not paid. Right. But during that time, their per diems extinguished, no reimbursements for expenses, and their staff's not paid either. But that will never happen. But then they shouldn't shut the government down. Yeah, Let's exactly go to right Michael now. Height for the first response. Well, I, I think you have to look at these people. Why are they doing this? And I think, you know, a lot of people run um, to go to Congress on the, the fact that we need to have a balanced budget. And we need to cut the spending that we're spending, all the spending we're doing over and over and over again. You can't <clears throat> continually run a negative deficit over and over and over again every single year our national debt is is through the roof and and republicans are just as guilty about this as democrats are and i think this group is finally saying you you've told us year after year after year we're going to do this and then nothing ever comes of it now we feel like we have to throw a bomb in the middle of this and blow the whole thing up in order to be heard in order for us to stop spending at the rate we're spending because at the beginning of the year it's about spending bills and then it's about you know raising the the debt ceiling at the end of the year and it's constant this this political football twice a year that we go back and forth with and i think these this group of people is just saying we've had enough we came to to congress uh to to make changes if this is the only way we can make a change I don't care whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats. This is what we're going to do. I think your phone's still blowing up because you yeah. said something nice about I, Obama a little bit ago, Mike. I, all I see is rhino, rhino, rhino. I mean, <laughs> you, you thought you were a zookeeper today. Is this, yeah, is this a radio show or an African safari? <laughs> Mr. Schultz, you're next. Um, I think that um, it's not it's not enough for us to say that 
they've got a point and this is important. Um, they don't necessarily, if they have a point or not, have the right to shut the government down. And the way I think justice ought to be served is to make them make that decision while every federal employee in their congressional district goes without pay. While every federal donation to their uh, well-being, like all the highway projects and all the other federal spending in their district, goes away. If you're not affected by shutting down the federal government over a budget fight, then why would you have any incentive not to do it? So shut your VA hospitals, Congress. Uh, shut the ones... Uh, shut the uh, federal spending to farmers, the federal aid to families, the federal aid to schools. Shut that all down in your district. That's what you wanted. You're going to get it. And, hey, that money we save will never have to pay those folks. So we can use that to reduce the budget. All of a sudden, they're going to say, well, wait a minute. We shouldn't have to bear the entirety of this. Yeah, you shut the government down. You sure should. So... It just seems to me that um, they're, they're making a stink because they can. And in the end, they ought to be made to go forth and say why it's so important that the federal programs that they do like, and there's lots of them, ought to also be cut. And they won't do that. They could put in bills to cut their own federal programs, the ones they like, and they don't put in those bills ever. What they do is they make this stink and shut the government down. It's never going to serve any purpose except more chaos and, in the end, more expense. It's more expensive to shut it down and open it back up again than it would be if you didn't do that. So they are wasting federal money that we could use to cut the deficit. <laughs> it's just insanity to me. Mr. Carl, well, I hate to admit this, but I... I Agree with a lot of what Larry just said. Oh my goodness! I got height praising Obama. I got Carl agreeing with Schultz. Uh, the, Is the know, world spinning backwards shut today? Shut it down. Now, now, now uh, Stubby's doing intros. Their 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 issue is an absolutely legitimate issue. It know, is without a doubt. But their method, if it if it ends up having the actual result of shutting down the government, that's a disaster, and that 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 makes them anti-american as far as i'm concerned but but to 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 negotiate and threaten you know votes and all that i mean that's just the political game and you know but and and their goal is a, is laudable but if if it if their method ends up actually setting down the government then they're the bad guys mr ferretti i, I agree uh you know it's, it's, it's taking a hammer to, to kill a fly uh they they uh, they can't come up with a persuasive argument on how to curb spending. They don't have the power of persuasion and, and getting other people to come to their side. So they throw a temper tantrum and shut the government down. And that's why Congress has probably the lowest rating it's ever had amongst the public in terms of support and respect. Uh, and it, it hurts everybody. They don't have the ability to do it. And we got to get somebody in there that has that ability then, uh, rather than these firebrands who just want to go to DEFCOM 1 and, you know, default on our debt and shut the government down. Uh, it, you know, come up with better solutions, folks. And, and when you do, have the power of persuasion and the power of facts and evidence on your side and get to work. But just to sit there and say, well, we're just not going to vote for this and shut it all down, well, that's why everybody hates you. And, and uh, I, I think that we have to demand more of these folks. Be smarter, be more persuasive, and figure it out. Uh, you know, the whole thing about – remember sequestration where Congress decided, well, we can't, you know, do what Larry suggested and pick and choose amongst these programs and cut. We're just going to cut across the board. That, that to, to many people who have studied that, the effect of that law, that's been a disaster. And so, but that's what they run to because they can't get the hard work done. It's a shame, but that's where we are. Bill, we go back to you. You were a person, lifetime federal employee. It's going to be an interesting, one of the interesting sidebars of the next couple of so months is how 
Kevin McCarthy will actually navigate uh, this uh, this impasse because right now uh, he has a group of 20 folks or so holding him hostage and he is he is bending to their will will he stand up and try to get a spending bill spending bills through that will avoid what we've just been talking about or will he just uh, uh, go along with what the uh, group of 20 are proposing and they're not proposing anything constructive. Right now, all they're proposing is we're going to shut it down. This, this kind of reminds me, and this, this, I guess we do this, what, every two years with, with this uh, shut the government down thing, maybe more often mm -hmm. now. It, it kind of reminds me when Obamacare was passed and Obama was president and the Republicans had a different health care plan they were going to propose if they ever got in power. And then they got in power and they had no alternative health care plan to propose. After, after four years of saying they had a plan, when it came time to show the plan, they had no plan. And this is, reminds me of something it, similar with this, this, this every couple of years shut the government stuff down. If you've got a better spending plan, put it forward and tell everybody where you want to make the cuts. Because I know Republicans don't want to raise taxes. So where are the cuts? And I don't want them to raise taxes either. As far as I'm concerned, we all pay enough taxes as it is. They ought to cut taxes and raise the revenues just like it happens every time. But if you got to, you got to cut spending if you're going to cut taxes. No, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Yes. You lower the tax rate and you raise the revenues. That happens inherently Mike, and it happened in 2017. Mike, did we raise revenues in the Trump tax cuts? Yes, absolutely. Then why the do we still have deficits? Because we spent too much more. That's why I said you got to cut spending. <laughs> I agree you got to cut. No, you just disagreed with me. No, 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 no. You, 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 you need to cut spending, but one way to have more revenue is to cut the tax rates. That's but, proven. Right, but I said with the, with the tax cut, you've also got to cut spending. I agree. Then yes. why did you keep saying you'd know? No, no, no. <laughs> he misunderstood. No, no. It, 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 it's, right. it, they're, they're, uh, you need to do both. There's, Thank you. There's, that's that's, agree that's that. where I was. Uh, Meeting in the middle ground. <laughs> I'm with you. All right, now we move on to issue number three, and for that we go to the delegate, Michael Hyde. All right, well, the, the, my first two on the list we've already addressed today, so I'll move on to issue number three. And it, it looks like the West Virginia House is about to go to 90 Republicans strong. Um, and and the, the Republican uh, leadership just keeps seem to be growing in, in, the, in the, le, the legislature. And so my question is, is this good for the state? I mean, there, there's at a point where it seems to me – like you may have too many of one party. And you, this is caused by the projection that Doug Scaff, who recently resigned as minority leader, will switch parties? That is correct. I mean, it, the rumor is that I mean, he's already resigned as the minority leader. The rumor is he's going to switch parties uh, to the Republican Party and then run for a higher office, a statewide office. Some say secretary of state. That's correct. All right. So to res in response to that, let's go to a person who obviously thinks there should be even more Republicans in office, Larry Schultz. Huh. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that there's a specific number where you where you reach that thing. I mean, my view is that the ideas among those 90 um, are not good ideas for the state of West Virginia. Uh, and so over time. Uh, there will be a tendency to, for it to roll back the other way. You know, I think some other things are going to be required. We need to get, uh, as the as we talked about in the first topic, we need to get uh, the, 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 the loon show out of the Republican presidential race and, and get people back to thinking about, okay, my, my man Trump's in jail, so... Uh, let's go ahead and pick a, a standard bearer who can fight for the country and bring uh, Americans together. Until we get that, there's not going to be much change uh, in the West Virginia legislature, uh, except to move maybe even closer to 100 to zero. Um, I, I don't, I don't have any illusions about that. I don't think that is particularly good for the state to answer the question because. The ideas on that side are many of them, in my view, wrong. Well, and so, be if we specific enact about these. Which, 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 which ideas are we talking about? <clears throat> well, for example, a woman's right to choose, um, c combined with you know they're slowly catching up to near eighty percent 
of the CPS uh, uh, jobs filled. But I mean, we still have one of the worst foster care systems in the 50 states. Um, it's, it, those two issues together make me nuts because there's going to be a bunch more foster children if women who want to not have a baby are forced to have one. And there's going to be a bunch more foster kids, even if, even if they uh, swear that they they'll be the best mothers they can. They never wanted to do this. The government's making them do it, and it's just not going to work. There's going to be a bunch more foster care, and we we don't seem to be moving on this. One exception to that, I will say, is Charles Trump. He is working very hard on this uh, on this foster care thing, and if his ideas can be pushed through and enacted, I think they can uh, really do some uh, good things statewide, regardless of who's in, in office. Um, it shouldn't be a problem. I mean, it, it, caring for kids whose parents are not competent or unwilling to be proper parents should be the concern of every single West Virginian, at, regardless of party, and regardless of anything. And if we don't do that, this this state will continue to do, as I jokingly say about Morgan County, we're an import-export county. We export 22-year-olds and we import 65-year-olds. And, and without without a giant hospital, that's going to eventually be a problem. But I don't you're, disagree but you're saving with on you. daycare like this. <laughs> I don't disagree with you on the foster care issue. And, and I... I I'm going to push back a little bit. It's not just Charles Trump. There are there are several people within the legislature that are foster foster parents, and this is a top issue for them. And this is being discussed within the legislature a lot. I, I don't doubt that. I mean, we got to see some action. I, 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 yeah, it's coming. I want to make sure I note this date: August the fourth, twenty twenty three. Larry praised a Republican. Carl agreed with Larry. Height praised Obama, and Bill did the intros. Ferretti, you're the only one so far who hasn't fit in on opposite day. He, he doesn't think he needs to change. <laughs> Joe, you're up. Uh, well, uh, there was a time, I believe, in the West Virginia Senate when the Republican caucus was a meeting of one meaning there was one Republican in the entire West Virginia Senate. And I would suspect that there are many people in this room right now who believe that that was not a good thing for the state of West Virginia. And I think the opposite is true if we get to the point where we're caucusing one or two Democrats uh, uh, up against uh, 98 Repo or Republicans in the House or, or uh, 30, what is it, 30 something in the Senate. Uh, Look, debate um, and different points of view are important to have when you're de deciding the public policy for the state. And uh, the Democrats, obviously, their ideas are, are falling out of favor with the uh, statewide electorate. But still, uh, we have to admit they have some good ideas that are worthy of consideration. So I would propose that uh, it's not a good thing if we have a further concentration of power in one party, even though we're headed that direction. I don't think that's a good thing for the state. And I hope that the Democrats can get their act together and start having some issues that appeal to a broader swath of West Virginians. Right now, they're struggling with that. Mr. Carl. Well, first of all, uh, party label and, and policy substance are not one you know identical or good yeah. point and and there in in the republican growing majority there's there's a you know a divergence of, of emphasis of, on different things and solution proposed solutions and i i, I appreciate larry and uh, mike also recognized his uh, compliment of trump was you know an example of that that there's you know, it's it's a substantive policy that that ultimately matters. You know, and 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 just the party label doesn't signal exactly the, the you know the political philosophy. So so you know it, it 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 it's a suggestion, but I you know I remember when the one size fits all 
Democrats bunch was running this state for most of my life, and you know that didn't turn out very well. So, but but I think it has more to do with the social policy than mm -hmm. just at the party labels. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, we mustn't forget that the uh, supermajority reflects the voting preferences of the state. And we are we vote in to the right now. We're very strongly to the right. Therefore, supermajority reflects that. But going back to Mike's question, is it good for the state? I think you have to break this down into what sort of issues. Uh, those issues that involve uh, infrastructure, operational, financial, I think it has been good for the state. Uh, case in point, the tax reform that we recently got through, uh, the DHHR restructuring we, we got through, those are, I think, good for the state. Would have been uh, gotten through without the mega supermajority, perhaps, but they, it was assured they would get through the mega supermajority. However, there's another suite of issues that I do not think that are as good for the state as what the three, that are the operational, financial, and infrastructure, and that would be the cultural issues. I think the supermajority have made, have introduced cultural warfare to a level that we have not seen in this state in the past. Some members of it. Well, but the super, it's reflected by the supermajority. But you're right, Mike. There is a group such as our rhino buddy here, Mike uh, Height, and I'm saying that, in, uh, and I'll take out the, the rhino label. Yeah. yeah, that was said facetiously. Mike and, uh, and several of his colleagues who currently remain in the majority of the mega majority have been, I think, emphasizing the, the uh, operational financial infrastructure side more so than cultural and i applaud you guys for this however there is a group of i think around 30 percent that have embraced the cultural issues more and i'm hoping mike you and mike hornby and other and john hardy and other folks like you are able to keep keep pushing back on those because that's where i think where it's, you ask the question is it good for the state i think on the cultural side less so Goes back to you, Mike. I, yeah, I think when you, when you look at the cultural issues, I think that's stemmed from the, the national um, spotlight of what's going on nationally, and there are some within the Democratic Party, um, within the state legislature that are on the same par with that and they push those cultural issues so you have those on the right that are pushing back and i think that's what you you don't see the internal struggle um unless you're there but there is that internal struggle where you have the the left that is pushing those cultural issues and what you see is a major push back because of the super majority uh, a lot of times if you talk to some of the Democrats that have recently switched parties, um, and, and most of them are moderates to begin with, um, if you talk to some of them, uh, some of what they're saying is, you know, I, I switched because um, the Democratic Party, when they got smaller and smaller, became less about policy and became more about obstruction. That their their whole game plan was, how do we keep from allowing um, Republican wins over and over again. And, and they said that that wasn't what we wanted to get accomplished. We wanted policy. Now, I'm not saying all of them are like that. I think one of the best pieces of legislation we had last session came from a Democrat, Kayla Young, um, where she pushed through that, you know, we need to have an age limit for West Virginians to get married. And, and that was taken up by the Republicans as well and, and backed her 100%, and, and we got that across the finish line. So there are good policies that come from the Democratic side, and I applaud them for that. But they need to focus on the policies um, that they can get through. I agree. Yeah. And, uh, Mike, uh, final word does go to you if you have anything else. Now's no, the time that, to wear. That was it. That was it. Very good. Then in that case, uh, Larry Schultz, you are on the clock. Da, da, da. And we come back after our commercial break here in studio with the Friday Five. Joe Joey Torts ready via telephone in studio with the Sarge, Delegate Mike Height, Mr. Mike Carl, the OG of the show, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, and on the clock right now, Larry Schultz. Yes. Um, will this brave expression by Jack Smith of faith in our constitutional processes and the rule of law be blown off by members of the former Law and Order Party with more whataboutism, or will this finally sink in as the self-preservation the USA is known around the world for? Well, I'm going to go first to a Republican to uh, counter, and that would be Michael Carl. Well, it, it's uh, up in the air. I, I agree with you know the the issue, but 
the 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 whole process is so complex and has so many you know pluses and minuses and so forth that that, that, that I, I, I i i think it's literally up in the air <laughs> i don't have a, a bottom line answer uh, or, or certain conclusion about how it's going to play out but but we uh, hopefully hopefully it'll it'll uh, be strong enough and and there'll be enough sense in the players uh, who who make a difference to that'll survive bill yeah you said the question will be blown off i think it'll be just the uh, just the opposite larry uh, i think that the uh, uh the candidates or the uh, the members of the party plus their immediate pat platform uh be it conservative or liberal uh or progressive will use it as just that a podium to broadcast or to reinforce their position uh so i do not think we're going to have a reckoning and coming together or realization that our uh, country's uh, democracy is on the at the tipping point i think it's going to be strictly an opportunity to reinforce through their through their outlets of, uh, of their positions mr ferretti yeah i, I um when they, when larry when you say blow it off uh you know and, and you reference the law and or, order party uh yeah i think to some degree that will occur and i we saw that uh, and we continue to see it in the florida case the, the uh classified documents case, two defenses are being pursued in that case. It is One is the legal defense that the lawyers advance in the courtroom with their motion practice and, and their arguments to the court. We don't get to hear a lot of that because, unfortunately, the federal courts are operating in the 1950s and don't allow cameras. And coverage like they should, which I which I submit as a disservice to the public. Then there's the other defense, which is the defense of the lawyers and the talking heads going out to the media and 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 offering political defenses. Okay, like these are the documents that the president handles all the time. Why can't he have them in Florida? And he didn't show them to anybody, so what's the big deal? Those aren't legal defenses. Those are political defenses. And I think you're going to see that also in this case in, uh, uh, in D.C. Already we're hearing free speech and, the, you know, the, the president can say whatever he wants. And that's true. In fact, that's in the indictment uh, that's recognized. But that's not a legal defense in, in, in court because what's being charged is the conduct of the president and his alleged co-conspirators, not what the president said to us about 200,000 dead people voting in Georgia and things like that. He can say that all he wants, even though there's no factual basis for it. But he can't act on that by threatening the secretary of state in Georgia with criminal prosecution. That's conduct that is being charged. Those are That's what's going to be handled in the courts. And that's what the attorneys are going to be dealing with in terms of devising defenses in court. But in the public, you're going to have debates about free speech and constitutional rights and and reliance on counsel and things of that nature. Uh, so you'll see a dichotomy here. And it's not adherence to the law and order to go to the public and try this case. Uh, and and I, I would just caution folks to be aware of that that there will be two defenses. There'll be a public defense and there'll be a legal defense. And I hope the court system opens up to the point where we can appreciate and understand the legal defenses that are going to be advanced in court. I think that would be a great service to the public. Mr. Height. I think Joe brings up a, a very important distinction um, when we're talking about law and order party and and one being political and one being actual about law and order and i i think when you you look at at a lot of the bigger cities that have democratic prosecuting attorneys and you see this this um catch and release type programs where there is no real prosecution for crime and and the crimes are committed 
they're brought in, they're released, they go back out and commit the same crime over and over and over again. And when you talk about the, the law and order party, I think the Republican Party is fed up with that kind of. That's where they get into the law and order type um, thing that we need to have some kind of reform. We can't. Th- there is no law and order there. We're, we're not we're not upholding the law when we do that that type of of policing the other issue you're talking about is political and i i would agree that there are times when the republican party on the political side sees much of what's going on in the political scene as political law and order that that we're going to prosecute based on which side of the aisle you sit on and and whether or not you're running for president or or higher office and it, it whether it's true or not a lot of this is just perception and when you see you know indictment after indictment after indictment a lot of times the perception is you're just going after him because he's running for president and this is all political he even said himself yesterday one more indictment i need to be president and, and, and he's gaining steam by that. He's becoming uh, the martyr because he there is a perception out there that they're just after him for political reasons. The law and order side of it is what you're seeing in the big cities. That's where we, what the Republican Party represents. Right. And there, of course, are a lot of people in those big cities who say that the law enforcement in the big cities is largely political and racial. And so... You can make that argument when you're charged with a crime, but it's sort of like Joe was saying, that doesn't have anything to do with this indictment about your conduct in either sort of case. The other thing that bothers me is the whataboutism where they have a hearing with, what was the fellow's name, Devin Strange maybe? uh, Whatever his name was. Uh, Hold on, Larry, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, Devin Archer. Devin Archer. Archer, yeah. Devin Archer uh, testified yesterday, and we were told by Comey that, or Comer, the the the, the chairman, uh, the Republican congressman, that that there's going to be all this stuff revealed about Joe Biden. And the guy said, "I have no knowledge whatsoever of any criminal conduct by Joe Biden." Uh, he, there, there was not; it was a nothing burger, and they're still talking about it. And they they set up the hearing to be the same day as Trump's indictment was released, so that they can. They can use this uh, whataboutism to claim, well, it's, you know, everybody does this stuff. Uh, and what about, you know, Hunter Biden? And what about the, it, the United States of America fell under attack on January 6th. They attacked our constitutional process. If we as a country do not stand up and put a bunch of folks in jail for it, including those who organized it, not just the people who carried it out, we are going to regret it. It's important. I, you know, I, yeah. I'm glad you said that because that wasn't one of the indictments that was brought forward. There was no no conspiracy to, for insurrection. Um, no, and, and he was, was supposed to be the one investigating January 6th. So if it, he didn't bring that, then it was a conspiracy to obstruct congressional proceedings, which it happened to be, and it's not a coincidence. But he never the mentioned counting of the electoral votes. No. Okay. But he charged the things that he charged, and if we do not seriously press that, then America's kind of given in. It's not quite the same, but if we were under attack from somebody uh, as a nation, we would expect to whoever the president was to respond quickly and forcefully, as forcefully as they could. And we've not done that so far in this. But now it's starting to look like we're going to, and that's crucial to sending the signal to other uh, would-be insurrectionists and obstructors of congressional hearings uh, that we're not going to tolerate this. But in Devin Archer's testimony yesterday, he may have said, I didn't see any criminal acts, but he did in his testimony um, say that a lot of the things that Biden has said he didn't do— he did do, so it, it, it didn't look good for for either Hunter or or Joe, um, in his testimony, where the, he may say, "Well, if, I didn't see any criminal acts." He didn't corroborate with what they were been saying for for if, a year now. If you've got, I'll say the same thing that I said with Donald Trump. If you've got the proof 
bring it to a court of law. Not this uh, mamby-pamby of a congressional hearing, bring it. And they had five years to bring it. They had all the time in the world to bring it, and they never did. They never did, and, and this is what we get every time. It's almost like if the Trumper uh, Republican operation says someone's a criminal, you can count on the fact that that person's not going to get indicted. And if they do, it'll, it'll blow away. And if they're saying, I'm innocent, you can also count on the fact that that's probably going to go by the boards too. It's really a misuse of our system, and it's systematic with Mr. Trump. And I'm glad, finally, somebody stood up and said, you commit a crime in this, co- in this uh, country, we're going to bring the charges. So if he's if he has found innocent of all charges, are you going to admit he was innocent? I don't have control over that, but he certainly is innocent in the eyes of the law. I have is to he admit innocent? that. No, I think not guilty is the actual terminology yeah. around. And I and I have to, yeah. And, and there's a reason why they OJ don't was say found innocent. not guilty. Yeah, yeah. Do you think he was innocent? <laughs> um, what I think isn't going to matter because the system will have decided what it decided. I'm not going to be particularly happy about it, but I won't be in a position to outguess the jury that heard the evidence. But I think the American people look at the system and say the system is broken, that these people at this level never get prosecuted and are never held accountable. I don't care whether it's the Republican side or the Democratic well, side. Well, it's been true of Donald Trump his whole life. And the Clintons. Long before, long before and he was Bidens. ever president. I don't. I don't really see that uh, as being I know, the same. Because you're a Democrat, but it's, you, it's not. You're the blind same. to the, the the things that are going on on your side. Yeah. Well, we're going to prove the things that are going on on the Republican side. When you get proof, when you get proof that'll stand up in a court of law, that'll be the time to tell me what that they're criminals. And on that note, we move to issue number five with Mike Carl. Well, I'm going to make it quick. Uh, well, you've got nine minutes, so it doesn't have to be too quick. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm throwing out a, a, a question. A, a, a question. Which is worse, Governor DeSantis' efforts to block and keep out of public schools the 1619 theory, you know, concept about racism in America, or Kamala Harris's? criticism of Governor DeSantis for that, that in some of the materials that he is calling to be used, there's a reference to the fact that uh, through slavery, uh, slaves, black people, uh, learned some, some, you know, functional skills and which helped them later in life when they were freed by the Republicans, which, which is worse. <laughs> Bill, you're shaking your head. You yeah, go first. I, I cannot I cannot imagine, Mike, any rational individual accepting the fact that slavery was good at any time. Slavery was a an embarrassment for our society. And trying to defend slavery under any grounds is just totally irrational. And that's why the Republicans ended it. Well, Mike, I, I'm not. Didn't they teach I, I'm, that to I'm, I'm you not, in Romney? Not, yeah, I'm not going to. They taught it to yeah. me in Sugar Grove, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I'm not going to label. <laughs> I'm not going to label this. This is as far as partisan, uh, but it's just inherently uh, it is wrong for anyone to say that slavery was good, and that's what DeSantis has said. And, but that the other thing he said, the school board uh, in, uh, enacted this, and DeSantis was behind it as long as it was good vibes. And then when it started pushing against it, DeSantis backed off and said, it was not my doing, not my doing. I just happened to be the governor, but it's not my doing. And I, I don't think he used the word good, by the way. I, I thought he, it was something about beneficial skills yeah, were acquired. I think you're exactly right. You're something right. to you're that right. effect. Yeah, yeah. Right, uh, let's go uh, to uh, Joe Joey Torts Ferretti. Well, this, this is an example of, of the race to the extremes, right? Uh, the, the Republicans' concern about the 1619 project is is the fact. Well, I don't want to say fact. I don't. I don't profess to understand it. But their concern is that uh, the teachings are that we have inherent racism in our society because of 
you know, what happened two, 300 years ago. And there's a lot of pushback about that. And, and we can debate, and I, I would welcome that debate about whether or not that should be taught in our schools uh, and, and teaching young kids that uh, they are inherently racist. I, I, I you know, just generally have an issue with that. So fair debate. But then so what <laughs> – Governor DeSantis does in Florida and what his cronies do and and the state election board down there and in the legislature is now they want to teach that uh, slavery is somehow a path towards vocational training (laughs) for people, which is just equally absurd. Uh, And this is what happens. These folks run to the extremes on both sides to try to get their point across. And isn't it somewhere in the middle we can meet and, and teach slavery factually in terms of what this country uh you know what, what's in our history and what we endured uh, without going overboard in either direction to, to argue that slavery had its appealing aspects and that we're all inherently racist as a result i i think there's somewhere in the middle we can meet and and this is where we have to again demand more of our politicians to to strike that middle rather than running to these extreme notions on either side of the fence. Larry? Yes. First of all, nobody ever taught in school that Democrats were responsible for doing away with slavery. Nobody ever taught that in any school. They now have a rule in Florida that will require that they teach children that certain slaves gained an advantage uh, through the job training uh, implicit in, I guess, turning you into a a penniless uh a uh, person who's owned like a piece of property and forcing you to learn how to be a blacksmith. Can we stop for at least a minute and agree that for a very long time in American slavery, people were born in slavery and they died in slavery. So whether they had job skills really didn't matter. <laughs> it was only at the end of slavery, admittedly done by the Republican party led by Abraham Lincoln through a war At the end, at the very end, the last tail end of it, there may have been, uh, you know, some people who had learned some skills uh, on the farm and uh, were able to take them out and turn them into jobs. Now, in most cases, the truth is they had to move an awful long way from where they'd been held as slaves if they actually wanted to be paid for that work. But it's such a tiny thing that even if it's true, that it's just a a tiny fraction of all the people who were ever slaves and how in the world, if that's the best you can bring up, then just go ahead and admit as, as, as um, Bill says, it was absolutely wrong. It, there's just nothing that you can bring up to mollify people about it. So I don't know if the comparison, I don't know if I accept the comparison. There's been talk about the 1619 project. I don't recall any of the 1619 Project stuff saying, let's pretend that the Democrats released the slaves. I don't think they say that. And so it's not a, a fair comparison. This other thing is insanity. Mr. Height. Um, well, the 1619 Project is theory. And I don't think we should be teaching debatable theory at the elementary or, or high school, middle school level. That that's That kind of stuff should be debated in higher education if at all because it is theory we should be dealing with facts the we get to the 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 part of the this new book that says that there were skills learned it's it's like in one sentence in this whole chapter of this section of this history book and when you look at Who was responsible for that? It was a committee of people that had black people on the committee that were were partly responsible for writing it in this fashion. So to say that 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 particular uh, sentence is racist, you've you've taken one sentence out of the whole chapter and and not looked at the whole context within. And it was written by some individuals who are black so they wanted that in there and they're they're actually the ones that are pushing back against this now as far as the 1619 we we need to get that out of the lower education that needs to be higher education but this if if you don't want it in there fine take that out maybe we shouldn't be teaching that mike carl final thoughts 30 seconds well i I 
agree with a lot of the insights here. The, the 1619 project simply is denying the great progress that's been made, and I won't go into details of who, who was involved in the progress. A lot of Democrats ultimately were involved in the progress. But they're just trying to deny that progress. And, 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 the, uh, the, but, and the, the truth is that they did gain skills, but that is so irrelevant compared. Final thoughts are brought to you by CMA Honda of Winchester. Joe, you're up first. Wishing everybody have a cool and safe you care. Mr. Larry Schultz. My doctor told me I shouldn't work out until I'm in better shape. I told him, okay, don't send me a bill until I pay you. <laughs> Admiral. <laughs> I'm going to yield my time to Mike Hike, but yeah. only but only after I finish my filibuster, which I'm just beginning right now. <laughs> and Mr. Carl. Uh, the Cardinals are falling badly, but I'm still going to focus on them because the, my fall teams are really looking Mr. bad. Mr. Height. I'm off to Charleston for interims. Let's hope we can get something done this weekend. Surprised that wasn't one of your issues, by the way. Hey, Dave Ramsey shows next. It's 10 o'clock. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg and TV 10. We'll talk to you again in 70 short hours.